Welcome ladies and gentlemen to another amazing episode of Endlu. And today on the show we have the beautiful, passionate Ozoz, popularly known as the Kitchen Butterfly. She's an amazing cook, photographer and writer. Welcome Ozoz to the show. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you very much. Your, your house is so beautiful. You have such a lovely home. You have so much character. Yeah. Um... Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted you to first introduce yourself. I had done an introduction, but I want the world, I want you to, in your own words, tell us who is Ozoz, who is Kitchen Butterfly. Okay, so my name is Ozoz. Um, I like to think of myself as a food lover, mostly. So whether that's writing, whether that's photographing, whether that's eating, um, researching history, culture, yeah, so I, I love food, um, but I think my general approach to life is one of exploration. So I also think of myself as an explorer. Mm. Um, I'm a geologist, that, that's my profession, but in particular I'm an exploration geologist. So exploration geologists are usually those who brave new frontiers, find the first kind of things. So. My whole life is really about exploration, so I, I think of myself as an explorer. Wow, you sound so excited. I, I'm <laughs> excited being close to you. At, at what point did you say, okay, you know what, I'm going to be a cook, I'm going to be a traveler by plate. What, what was the defining moment for you? What time, when did the light bulb just come on? Like, this is what I, I like this, I'm going to do this. Well, I've always loved food. Well, since I was nine. Um, but I think there have been a couple of episodes in my life that have shaped my relationship with food. And both of them happened when I was away from home and outside of Nigeria. The first time was when I went to university in Liverpool in the UK. And I was homesick a lot. And one of the ways in which I could connect with where I was coming from, connect with my heritage, was through food. So I found myself cooking a lot of things, jollof rice, and kusi, nothing major, just basic things. But I found myself doing them so often that I began to do them very well. And the second experience was when I worked in the Netherlands. And um, I remember one night going to a restaurant with colleagues of mine. And my colleagues were from different parts of the world. There, was, there were people from Brazil, there was a guy from the UK, they just, it was just a mix of people. And that night at dinner, we started talking about foods from home. And then this guy starts talking about a particular thing that they make in Brazil. And he was going on and on about how they make it from beans, and then they fry it in palm oil, which he called dende. And then he was talking about how specific women, only a certain group of women, who are daughters of a goddess, Inasa. And you know, there are things he said that were new to me, but things that he said that were familiar. And then I said to him, I said, well, that's, that sounds very much like Nigerian Akara. And he was like, yes, we call it Akara Je. And it was something the slaves brought, you know, at the turn of the century yeah. when, you know, the way they were, they were during slave trade and all that. And I think that for the first time it struck me that there was something more to food because you can imagine these people forcibly torn from their homelands, transported across thousands of miles to places where they're very unfamiliar, but yet they found a way to keep the bit of their home. They recreated Akara, you know? But, but, but different from the way we have Akara here, it became something that they started worshipping. It was almost something that they, they celebrated much more than we do with our own Akara. So I think that was one of, that was the strongest defining moment. It made me realize that there was a whole other layer to, to food. Okay, okay. So Akara has so much history. I'm just like eating more Akara. I think I, I'm a goddess daughter of Sarah as well. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Please. Okay, so I wanted to ask, I, I see that you specialize in African dishes. Your ingredients are mainly homegrown. Is there a reason why you do this? Do, are you trying to, what's your main purpose of specializing? Because from what you said, you've 
been to a lot of countries, you've met a lot of different people. So you could have learned how to cook French food or Indian food, but you decided to specialize in African dishes and homegrown, homegrown ingredients. Is there a reason why you do that? Um, I think that I just realized how uncelebrated Nigerian food is. Um, when, I, when I read in books about African cuisine, I'm like, there's nothing like African cuisine. Yeah? There's West African cuisine, yeah? There are common elements between food in Nigeria and Ghana and Cameroon. There's East African cuisine, you can connect the food of Tanzania and Kenya. But I think that African cuisine, is, as a label, is so broad, one. So I think that we need to focus more on what each country has, you know, the kind of food and the things that define that particular cuisine. But I'm also amazed at the richness of Nigerian cuisine. Like we have ingredients, we have colors, we have things that have amazing flavors and textures. And I think that we, what I would like to do is to celebrate them. Um, in the last few years, I, my philosophy has been something I like to think of as the new Nigerian kitchen. That's what I call it. And essentially, it's, it's a celebration of Nigerian food. It's, it's understanding the ingredients, understanding that they have many more uses than we traditionally have considered. So for instance, take every scent leaves, or Uncheon as the Igbos call it. Scent leaves have typically been addition to pepper soup or pottages. But the flavor profile of scent leaves is so amazing. You, you have the herbiness, you have citrus, you have fresh, and it's not, you can use it in drinks, you can use it in sweet recipes, you can use it in savory recipes. So it's just understanding that what we considered as limited use for a lot of our own ingredients, these things actually have multiple uses. You can apply them in different ways. So that's my, that's my desire, to be able to explore Nigerian ingredients and just showcase showcase the beauty and amazingness. Okay. Do you think that affects what if what what do you think what effect does that have on Nigerian food? I mean, do you think what you're doing is bringing Nigeria out more? Do you think you're redefining Africa to the world? Because as I just say, because yes, it's Nigerian, but at the same time, it's African. So, do you, do you feel like you're redefining Africa to the world? Basically, I don't even. In a way, yes. But I also think that I'm, I'm broadening the perspective of Africa and broadening the perspective of Nigerian cuisine, but also of Nigerian stories. Because there's, there's I think there's so many different dimensions to, to who and what Nigeria is. Whether that's in music, whether that's in, in, in arts, like in visual arts, whether that's in photography, there's so many different facets. And I think that this just adds to the richness and to the diversity of, of what we have. Wow. What we have. Wow. You know, the first time I saw you with your blogspot, I was amazed. I was, I was blown away, really, when I saw the um, Suya Spice Gary Cross Dead Chicken Spot eggs. I had to call my dad and be like, Dad, Look at this. So I, 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 I wanted to ask you, what inspires you? I mean, do you just eat something and be like, okay, this will taste nice with this other thing? What inspires you to create this thing? It's many things. Um, one is memories. So memories of things I've eaten. I mean, I grew up with Mr. Big's scotch eggs and Mr. Big's donuts. And if you ask anyone from the 80s, like people who were children or adults in the 80s, not young people, like, I've asked people who were children in the 80s, Mr. Big's Donuts and Scotch Eggs went to die for or to live for. <laughs> they, were, they were the most, like, perfectly spiced, perfect crust. So one of, one of the things that inspires me most is memory. Like, things I remember from less stressful, younger <laughs> times, but also travel. And then I watch TV, not a lot, and um, my favorite TV program is MasterChef Australia. And sometimes I see things and I'm like, well, I could easily do that with Gary as a replacement. Um, and I, my desire is not just to 
do crazy and outrageous things in Nigerian food. But it's to actually show that Gary, Gary is gluten free, which means that for people who have gluten allergies, it's a wonderful substitute for breadcrumbs. You know, same as you would use cornmeal. But also, it brings a slightly sour flavor, but also an amazing crunch. So, and also it's cheaper as well. It's cheaper so that, so basically anybody can make those scotch eggs with Gary, if you're interested. So for me, it's just understanding that a lot of our homegrown ingredients are... Uh, we can use them for so much more. So much more. So much more. Yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, I was listening to your TED talk, and you said uh, when you were nine years old, the um, first time you had a proper, you ate a lot, it was that way yeah. So I was wondering, do you still eat at places like that, like McDonald's, just for the, just for sentimental reasons? To be honest, um, not anymore, because I don't know, something about the smell puts me off. <laughs> but, but when I was at university, Burger King was my thing, like, McDonald's breakfast or pancakes, and then Burger King burgers and fries. Like occasionally I would I would still eat fries, but I just find that, yeah, the swap puts me off. Oh. And of course, knowing that a lot of those things are not made with the greatest of care, and now also. A lot of that. Well, I'm not so big on I mean, I, eat, I will eat deep fried, I will eat salads. I don't discriminate when it comes to food generally. <laughs> but, 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 but I think now that I have a, a different relationship with food, there are a lot more considerations that, that I think about. Yeah. Okay, okay. So your last trip to Kenya, I saw that you had to eat um, roasted termites. I didn't have to. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, not I, have I to, tried. You know, the, yes. the adventurous part of you. I'm not like that. Please, what are you thinking? How, how did it taste? Did you like it? I didn't really like it. <laughs> But the, the thing is that I, sometimes I push myself, I'm like, okay, you know what, I want to try this, um, I want to experience what the texture is like. Some days before that, a friend and I had been talking about bugs, he lives in Asia and he is going on and on about how he had tried different bugs and crickets and termites and how healthy they were, nutritious. And then a few days after that, I was reading a magazine and it also talked about Bugs, and it, the magazine is called Ogoji. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's published in South Africa. And they had this beautiful spread of um, recipes with bugs, from smoothies to bakes. And then there were these termites as well. So I was like, I, I, I've eaten termites before. I've eaten fried termites before in the rainy season. Yeah, I think in Delta City. No, not, not just even in Delta. When I was at, I went to university in Ife for a while. Okay. But back from there, I went to university. And in the rainy season, we would get termites, I would pluck off the wings, I would fry them. And the texture was a bit of crunch and a bit of cream. And so I was interested in seeing if, in yeah, Nairobi, if I would get that same, if it would trigger the same memory. But they cooked it in a particular kind of native salt, which I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really enjoy it. I didn't, I didn't quite like it. So I, I managed a few mouthfuls and then, yeah. <laughs> but it was an interesting experience. It, it does sound like more. Well, it's interesting. Okay, so... Um, Not one that I'd necessarily repeat <laughs> soon, but yeah. <laughs> At least you've tried it. I don't think I would be bored enough to do it. I'm, no, I can't do it. <laughs> okay, so... Kitchen Butterfly has become very big. I mean, from Knickknack to your interview with Polisa to GTV, um, May 1st and 2nd. And I was thinking, did you expect it to become this big? When you started, did you expect your blog to become so popular? Did you expect your recipes to win awards? Were you expecting all of this? No, I wasn't. And it's still, I mean, I started my blog out of a desire to, one, express myself. I had all these recipes, I had all these ideas, I had all these things I wanted to do. And my blog was kind of the holding ground for them. There was never any thought about being popular or being accepted or winning awards. I was just doing what I love and sharing it primarily for myself, first of all. And, and, and till tomorrow, 
it will almost always be about me. It's 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 this is this is the record I'm keeping for myself. It's a catalogue. It's my legacy for myself for my children, really. So it it always surprises me when people think of me as a star. I'm like, com almost completely uninterested because <laughs> that, that 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 was that was that's not my purpose. That's not my goal. My goal really is to is to give a voice to Nigerian cuisine. Um, to, is to share my ideas, hoping that it might inspire one or two people to either experiment with Nigerian food or, or or share their own stories as well. So for me, it's it's encouragement. But it's not it. my my goal is not to become world famous. If that happens along the way, yeah. But that my ultimate goal is is self expression and and and, and sharing. I am inspired, so I guess you are basically achieving what you want to achieve. So I, I was also going to ask, um, you're about that food. So how do you mix the traveling and the picking with the kids? Is it, are you enjoying it? Is it, does it get tedious sometimes? Do you have to miss the tea meetings sometimes? Yeah, you know, the thing is that um, I learned about five or six years ago that um, if I wanted to give my best as a mother, I would have to make sure I make time for myself. And two things informed that. One of them was there was a period when I would go to work very early so I could come back early to be with my children. My children would run up to me, they would hug me, they would kiss me. And then they'd be off outside playing with their friends. And I'd be like, wait, see these children that I rushed back from work for. And but but interestingly, I never doubted their love for me. Right? I knew that they loved me, but they had their own lives. And they weren't going to let me truncate their hustles and truncate their, their, their energy. Fun, right? <laughs> but I found that when I want to make decisions, when I want to go play with my friends, I always question, or even when I don't question, people want to question whether or not I love my children. The two of them are they're completely separate. For me to be able to give anything, to be able to be the mother that I am, I have to have a life. I have to have a life that my children can see, that they understand, because they too have their lives. So I always say that if you're if you consider yourself to be a fountain, you have to be full. So I have to do the things that energize, that inspire, that encourage, and that bring balance. And I think, but I think that we've also kind of found a way to make things work. So sometimes um, on my computer doing stuff when my children are doing their homework, sometimes I let them cook while I sit down. You know, I think we kind of we we kind of work working. And I don't think there are rules. I think that the 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 thing where people get stressed out, I still get stressed by you. But when people get feel really under pressure is when. There are certain prescriptions and rules that they think that they yeah. have to follow. I don't think I think that whatever works for you as a as a family, as a parent, do it. You have a beautiful home, so I don't I don't doubt that you may have yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It, it isn't right. always like this, it's chaotic sometimes, <laughs> but you know, that's like Joys of motherhood. <laughs> okay. So I I wanted to ask for your advice for the youth, youth with the passion to redefine Africa. In the sense that I'm sure when you decided to do this, it wasn't something that was very popular. So what what is your advice to people who want to do things that are not necessarily popular but they have a passion for? What would you say to them in the Africa of today, in the Nigeria of today? What advice would you give them? Do it. You know the the thing is there's no one way to tell a story. There's no one right way to to talk about African cuisine. There are different perspectives. And I think that the world is big enough for the multitude of perspectives to be accommodated and accepted. I think that if you if you find something you want to do, do it. Invest your time in it. Invest your energy in it. Read about it, ask questions, watch TV, listen to the radio, research, practice, experiment, 
You know, people always ask me how I know so much about food. I, I invest time and energy in food. I go to the market, I ask market women about tips, I ask them questions. Um, I read, I watch TV, I listen to people who have done things before. My children sometimes come up to me with amazing ideas. I think you have, the first thing is that you have to be open. You have to open yourself to all these things. And it might make you feel vulnerable, but you have to open up yourself to, to these ideas. You have to open up yourself to, to, to learning. And then you have to ask questions. You have, you have to be inquisitive. You have to be curious. And you have to be excited. You know, like, so for me, something as simple as finding like mangoes being in season, like, like you have you have to you have to you have to just be a child again. You you have to be willing to let yourself be excited about whatever it is you're going to do. And the fact that you enjoy it and the fact that you have a passion for it doesn't mean that it won't be difficult. Doesn't mean that you don't get tired. I don't cook every day. I love food. I think about food almost every single minute. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that. There are times I don't want to cook, and there are times I don't cook. In fact, there are times my children will be like, you know you haven't cooked anything, this, anything special this week. But so, so the fact that you love something doesn't mean that you want to do it all the time. But when I'm not cooking, I'm thinking about food, I'm tasting food in my head, I'm planning what I'm going to cook next, or I'm planning what I'm going to read about or write about, you know. So let yourself be consumed by that thing. I mean, a lot of people always think that money is everything. I think that if you if you start doing whatever you want to do, whether it's carpentry, whether it's being a makeup artist, and it doesn't matter who you are, guy, girl, you know, start, start in that thing, start in that thing, be consistent, be interested. People will see that passion and people will support you in ways that you, like, you won't even believe, you know. And, and then also sometimes you get the most outrageous ideas. Don't, don't, let your, don't let your grand goals and your grand visions scare you, you know? You, they may not be accomplishable the minute you think of them, but just make a, make a little note of them and you'll be surprised what will happen, how things, the landscape will change in a year or two. I mean, half of the things I do with food now, I've been doing for five, six, seven years. Yeah, even longer. But people will see me today and think that like, this is, oh gosh, like she's just suddenly appeared. But this is, this is, it's been a work in progress. But you have to show up, you have to be consistent. You just have to be present. Okay, thank you very much. It has been amazing. I feel like I've learned so much. I mean, maybe I'm overdoing it, but I'm so inspired. Because the first time I saw everything, I was like, wow, you're so creative and so beautiful. I, I've almost lost if I'm not sorry. Don't started. be <laughs> but but th thank you very much. I think I think it's important that we have these Nigerian and African platforms where we share everyday stories. I'm not I'm not you know, I don't think that I'm different from anyone else. Um, I, th I just think that I found what inspires me, I found what encourages me, I found what I'm passionate about, and I've also found a medium to express it. But it also helps that there are platforms like this that are, that are helping, that are sharing these stories that encourage and inspire people. So thank, thank you too very much for taking the time to talk and to, and to share and to find out a bit more. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us on an amazing episode of Amy. We had a beautiful other on the show. I've learned so much. I hope you have as well. I'm so inspired. I hope you've been inspired as well. Join us next time. Have a nice time. Thank you.